Hello and welcome to this edition of the Potomac Local Podcast. Today, Tom Osina joins us. Tom is seeking his second term on the Manassas City Council. He was first elected in 2020 and he is making his uh, election, um, a bid for re-election in the November 2024 general election. Uh, Mr. Osina, thank you so much for coming on with us. I'm delighted to be here and have the chance to kind of cover some of the things that have been going on for the last four years and more importantly, uh, uh, my vision for the future for the city. Well, let's start with that vision and what your platform is. So as you're going out and, and doing door knocking and talking to voters, right. uh, what are you what are you telling them that that you see are some of the most important issues facing the city? Well, let me first say, let's talk about when I first ran. Uh, when I first ran, I um, I had three things that I specifically mentioned to, to voters. Uh, one of them was that I, uh, I wanted to see uh, city publications, communications, uh, and even um, at our, our council meetings and work sessions that there would be Spanish translation. Uh, for those that may not know, I live in Georgetown South, which is a predominantly a majority minority uh, neighborhood. Uh, the overwhelming uh, language uh, spoken here is Spanish. And there were a lot of my neighbors, people that I knew that uh, just just had difficulty navigating city government, whether they were going on for forms, trying to uh, go to meetings. In fact, they didn't go to meetings because of that language uh, uh, barrier there. That's not to say they didn't speak English, but let's be honest, we're always comfortable in our in our home language uh, whenever possible. And uh, I, I see firsthand the assimilation that takes place. I have neighbors on both sides of me. One is a Vietnamese family, one is uh, a Latino family, and I watch the kids grow up. And while Vietnamese or Spanish is spoken at home. They are bilingual. They, uh, they in many ways uh, respect the, the culture that they grew up in, but they love wearing American clothes and they like all the things that any American kid uh, would like. And as they, as they grew up and go into jobs, you know, they're, they're, they're English as well. They, but they have the added benefit of being able to speak a second, second language along the way here. Nonetheless, so that was one goal. Number two, uh, again, uh, si sitting in my neighborhood, I, I saw that many people who, who uh, live here were renters about, and the number uh, percentage may be a little bit off, but approximately 50% of the people who live in Georgetown South rent, the rest are homeowners. And let's face it, home ownership is to me, from what I've observed, one of the best ways to build up generational wealth. And if we can help families own property, own their own home, what they pass on to their children or they have for their retirement is so much important. So building building what I would call, I call it attainable housing, because I think sometimes affordable is not as encompassing as uh, it, it could be. Uh, for some people, it's a pejorative word and I don't I think we can talk about this. So I wanted to bring attainable housing discussions to the city council. And the third one was I wanted to see more of the city um, look like in its city's boards, commissions, in, uh, in all the volunteer capacities that we have. So over the four years, uh, I pushed for along with, uh, and, and you know this well, Uriah, that uh, no one single council person can make something uh, happen. It takes f at least four votes. But over time, uh, we, I was successful in, in, in leading at least the effort to bring a, a uh, communications person who's fluent in Spanish, who now many of our publications and forms, our posters for the museum events and other things of that sort are bilingual. She shows up at meetings and even if there isn't a um, a need for her, she stays. For instance, our town hall meeting, she was there. Nobody needed her assistance, but it was good to show that we have that. And then lastly, uh, uh, just just having that has opened up the gates for more people. She does things, uh, I think, on Instagram, for instance, during uh, city council meetings. 
Second one about attainable housing. Well, I think you know we've we've made some steps. When I joined, nobody on council on council level was a talk, talking about that. And over time, we educated ourselves a bit, and now we're at the point where we have some opportunities in the city to uh, address possible attainable housing. And attainable housing, just so people know, make it. We're talking about workforce housing. We're talking people below the medium uh, area um, uh, income talking about aging in place. That's what I mean by uh, attainable housing. And then lastly, first on the appointments committee and now as the chair for the last two years, our boards, committees and commissions have far more diverse representation than ever before. I wanna uh, drill down on that uh, housing. So the proponents of affordable housing or attainable housing as you call it, uh, say that the price of rent is just too darn high and especially in Northern Virginia. And so we can't afford to live and work in the same community. Um, we have to uh, may maybe live you know, outside of Manassas and drive to Manassas. And, and so, um, so there is a push there to, to make uh, uh, people who want to live and work in the same place to be able to make that happen. Exactly. On the yeah. flip side of that coin, you have people who say the market is the market and it will set the price for housing. And if it's just too darn expensive, then that is just capitalism at work. And then so th therefore, if the city wants to set affordable housing, maybe the city becomes a landlord and buys up more property. And then it becomes uh, the, the, the decider of who lives in its housing. Uh, so, so where's the balance between that, and 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 where do you go from there? Well, fair question there. So, you describe the situation that that I hear, I'm sure you hear along the way, and depending where you sit, probably kind of influences which side of the that that discussion you 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 are on. Um, for me, the the Manassas Shopping Center purchase gave, gives a wonderful opportunity for us to mix in with whatever else is developed there, some attainable housing. And the reason I say that is first, when that issue came up, I, I tried to be one of the people on council that does my due diligence. And by that, I mean, I like to, to uh, look into the issue, ask questions behind the scenes. That's why on these big issues, whether it's Wawa, or uh, the shopping center or the commercial air service there, I usually have a statement to read. And I read it because I wanna make sure I say what I need to say, not try to work from my memory, uh, but I try to do all of that. And for me, the shopping center purchase, um, I had some initial misgivings and I went back to the sector plan that was 20 years old now that sector plan included Centerville uh, Road as well here, but it included Mathis. But the vision of the citizens who put that together and the city councils at that time were, were at that time st talking about affordable housing as a part of what's going on. So keep in mind, the shopping center is only part of Mathis Avenue there, but hopefully it will be a catalyst for what will come in the future here. And it's a chance for us to show the possibilities. The way the city grows is generally through redevelopment. We don't have that much vacant land anymore. And so by redeveloping things, the shopping center has a lot of land that isn't being used to be quite honest. Those large parking lots, for instance, the buildings that are set back there that are not in the best quality here. So using the sector plan, as I said, as a guide, it showed me this is a possibility that a portion, and, and I, I'm not down to percentages on anything at this point. We're still, we're still working on getting the shopping center. You know, the economic development commission's working on going through and do and and, and seeing what we have and, and that sort of thing. But I, I going to say that there will be discussions, and I will be a proponent that somehow we work in some attainable housing, one or more of those things. But to your point about the cost, the other thing is, is that sometimes we build things, even attainable housing, the most expensive way. And by that, I mean, what I think we, we ought to be doing is looking at innovative ways. And by that, I mean, finding builders, developers who are going to be innovative. How can we lower the cost of construction? Instead of doing 
you know, uh, uh, bricks and sticks and so forth, and we do everything right on the site. Does prefabricated modular units make sense to lower the actual cost, first of all, so that when we are either renting or selling, that these, not the city, the developer is doing this, is already starting at a lower price point to begin with here uh, in, in that regard here. I do not want to see the city to be a landlord at all. And even though we're hiring a housing coordinator that uh, we've advertised the position at this point, uh, who is going to assist at this, I'm not envisioning that the city in any way, shape or form is going to be a landlord uh, for, for any kind of attainable housing. Let me ask you this. Is, does the city have a pot of money set aside for a, a, a affordable housing that, that they could use um, from the budget, the general fund, or wherever, tax money to, to, to help people get homes? And if it doesn't, should it? So many, many years ago, there was the uh, what was called the Manassas Housing Trust Fund, I believe in the 90s. And it had some money in it. And believe it or not, there was a housing coordinator back then. So this, this, the idea of this position now is not necessarily new. Now, don't forgive me. That was before I moved to the city. I moved to the city in 2000s. And I'm, this was taking place in the 1990s, I'm told here. And that gave some assistance to people who could, uh, in their down payment, and they had to stay in their houses for a, a certain number of years. I think it was like 10 or 15 years, this sort of thing. There were provisions if, if it got sold. But again, to get the benefit of this, this, this additional money. So we have uh, put in, so the, the housing trust fund but that the city formed has always existed. It's just been dormant, had not been doing anything. And, uh, and so now with the housing coordinator, I'm expecting that that will be revitalized. We will have some appointees to it. Again, I don't know who will be on it at this point, even though I'm the appointments chairman, we haven't as as a council discussed what kind of representation we'll want on there. But so so this new will this be a new uh, committee with with a point as you said appointees on it and w with uh, the ability to direct funds from the trust fund. Well, we have allocated, I believe, and and forgive me, I should know, but this was way back <laughs> during budget time, and a lot has happened. I know we, we allocated, I believe, a million dollars to put in the housing trust fund. It's the first time it's had any money in a long time, decades along the way. Now, I when I hear about other housing trust funds elsewhere, a um, million dollars can be spent pretty quickly, you know, depending on what you do, rental if it's rental assistance or it's a down payment or what. So one of the questions that's going to face council in the future is, how do we replenish that fund? Do we have to grow that fund along the way uh, on that? Those haven't taken place because, as I said, for me, the, the, we are just at the ground floor. Getting a person, seeing a possibility of where it might, where some uh, development for attainable housing might take place. And then we'll have to see what the housing coordinator is thinking what our discussions are, what our community input, because you know this city has adopted this process of having community conversations, input. And I think that's a great way to hear, be, because let's face it, the six of us on council don't, are, don't know everything. In fact, I learn a lot more at town hall meetings and those kinds of community conversations about things I'd never thought of. And this, this is important along the way. So I come in, you know, with an idea, I share it with you about the modular aspect of it. I may find out that that's not a workable thing, but I need people to come in and be thoughtful about it along the way. And so but, I think but, but two follow-ups on the Manassas uh, shopping center. You're not at a point where you can say what percentage should be affordable no. housing. You're no. not there yet. And, and secondly, on this committee that, that you guys are working on, um, will it be, the committee makes recommendations on which projects to green light and then the council will then have yeah. the up or down vote on whether or not to allocate the money most definitely all okay. our committees all our committees are, are advisory except of course like the economic development commission our zoning appeals 
but those are quasi-judicial, you know, have a quasi-judicial aspect to that along the way. And and that's why they have some, some they have the independence they do. This would, any decisions made by that housing trust uh, group uh, would have to be, if it's spending money, it would have to be approved by council. The majority. Gotcha. Gotcha. I, I want to switch gears here and and talk about the schools. And I'll preface this is uh, preface this with the same way I prefaced our discussion with uh, Councilman Wolf. You, the school board controls the schools, and they're in charge of it, the the school ma the management and from top down. Right. Uh, but the city council is a chief funding source for the school division. And and each year they come to the city council hat in hand asking for money to, to, to fund the school operations. We have a report on our site today, PotomacLocal.com, just published, and it shows that the school division is, it, the SOL, the standards of learning scores are in, and Manassas lags 20% behind most of the other Virginia jurisdictions when we compare the Manassas numbers with the other jurisdictions. We also know that Osborne High and Metz uh, Intermediate are not fully accredited schools. They're still operating on this provisional accreditation that is a product of the COVID era. And so one wonders if you would be willing to have a conversation about setting specific benchmarks when it comes to improvements within the school when the school board comes hat in hand asking for funding during the upcoming budget cycle. So you describe that relationship very well. Um, and uh, I, as you know, we have an elected school board. And uh, that elected school board, the, the residents, the voters, get to choose the people to guide the school system, just as they do with city council. And while we, you're, you're right, city council is the one that allocates. We want to hear from the uh, the school board about what their budget priorities are. And along the way, we don't get into the matters of, of, of the specifics of how to spend, spend that, that, that money uh, along the way. So there's no question, you know, I think you ask, ask a question that I end up wearing two hats about. One is I'm a resident and uh, I, I care deeply about the, the quality of education because I look again at my particular neighborhood, but I look at others around the way and education can be a great source of, again, economic su success along the way uh, on that. But I also re realize the political realities that uh, what whatever I might say when I put my city council hat on, the school board is the one that's going to make, make those decisions. My style of leadership has been to I won't say work behind the scenes, but try to build a consensus. If you paid any attention to our discussions about uh, the new Dean replacement school, you saw that I tried to keep the focus on our discussions on getting the new school uh, designed, uh, locations decided and, and done. And we're well on our way. In fact, at our last uh, meeting, we heard more details about uh, the bids are going to be received and opened in the middle of October there uh, on that. But we did have some contention about what to do with the old property. And, and I'll be honest, I talked to school board members behind the scenes to hear what they had to say. I talked to fellow counselors along the way here. And that allowed me in that particular case to, when we got to the point of approving the, the um, SUP for Dean, it included a provision that the old dean was going to come down within 18 months of construct the start of construction of the new dean but we wanted to hear meaning council wanted to hear what uh, uh what, what the school board might do with that old dean property once the new school opens and the new the old school is taken down and we've asked them for a master plan report by september of next year now, to me, those are the kinds of ways we can be of assistance to the school board uh, along the way. They may not particularly always like, and I will tell you, not all of them liked <laughs> getting that kind of guidance along th that way here. And so it is, uh, to me, it's a fine line. It's better to build consensus and cooperation along the way. I believe that every school member uh, on there right now 
Every school board candidate that running wants better schools and recognizes some of the problems you just addressed. But that's not the only thing. I'll get, if I may, I know I've gone a little long, but let me give you an example. Over the four years, I have tried very hard to make a, a point of going and visiting the schools for a half a day. And by that, and then I asked to sit in in classrooms. And generally, the classrooms I want to sit in is, is not necessarily a regular uh, academic class. But for example, I asked to sit in on a uh, ESOL class. And I, there, there the class is being taught. It's in one of our intermediate schools. And everybody there, Spanish is spoken at home. That's what they're, they, they've heard for most of their lives. They're learning English and the class is conducted in English. And so there's a class of about 20 students. But one of the students had just arrived within the last two weeks from outside the United States did not know any English. And our teachers and our school system have to still teach that kid. These are the kind that I sat in on a special education class. One teacher, two aides, approximately eight students along the way. And I saw that intense, that many uh, instructors there having to work with that small number of students to, to help them learn, learn life skills, behavior skills, all the social skills that you and I pretty much, you know, take for granted along the way. I use those and one might say they're extreme, but this is an example that I think every day goes on in our schools. They're presented challenges and and it a one size fits all is not necessarily the, the, the best route. And so we have to, to recognize that right now there are some challenges to our school system that may not be in other school system that we are being compared to when, when you look at test scores. Do I want test scores to be high? I don't, I don't think there's a single counselor on, on, on council or school board member that would say no. But I, we also have to recognize that it's not gonna happen overnight. And it's not gonna happen by leaving, you know, giving them less money along the way. We have to appropriately give them money, and that's where uh, a year of, in last year's budget, I led the effort to get the school system one and a half million dollars more just for teacher salaries, mm -hmm. for retention purposes, recruitment purposes. And that was included in the budget year we're in right now. To well, me, would you be open to any time. benchmark discussions in the, in the upcoming budget cycle? I, I would have to reserve judgment. I, I'm going to leave them to, to be the school board, to be the ones. The voters are choosing them, and I'm going to have to trust the, the voters, uh, uh, you know, a, a guidance to, to be sure that they're, uh, you know, picking the people they think are going to do those sorts of things. And, and given the fact that we stated with, with, the, with, with, with the scores and the accreditation status of the two schools, do you think this, the school board has the right plan? Do you feel like the school board's on the right track? I'm going to say from what I've observed so far, because I have visited um, both Mets, excuse me, I was getting a tickle in my throat, so, um, uh, and and Osborne, I believe they are. It's not a, you know, I, I, these are always works in progress. When I was a school teacher many, many years ago, it was a work in progress too. Uh, the, the stories I can tell you about just discipline at, at times. And so, they are what they are, but you have to, uh, you know, the fact is you got to be creative and look at things along the way and not throw up your hands and say, oh my gosh, the sky's falling. I want to ask you about um, the purchase and selling of property. The city over the past 10 years has been actively selling and buying property. It, it's been very active in the real estate game, if you will. We've seen properties like uh -huh. sold at the airport for data centers, for a data center that will come online. Uh, we've seen the city uh, get more headlines for purchasing property because those properties built were used for fire stations and police stations. Right. And of course, um, what we what we think may be in, uh, a hotel coming to downtown, unless you want to break some news here and tell us exactly <laughs> what that's going to be. Uh, we'd love to hear that from you. Uh, and, and now the Marsteller Middle School property, which we uh, heard will now be a community center. Uh, and, and so 
so the, there is a perception that the city is is actively buying more property uh and and like i said you get headlines for it because it's it's always for a public use generally generally for a public use we'll see about that hotel property um but 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 do you think that this trend of of property purchasing will continue from the city council and 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 what should the residents um see as as the city continues to to buy property and engage in the real estate trade well let me let me first say and because this is in closed session i am not i'm i'm not at liberty to to identify the properties and so forth but over the four years that i have been on uh council uh city council has passed on purchases of property now of course that doesn't get set headlines because well that's not known all along the way here uh, but that would be safe to assume we're not buying everything that we find along the way even though i'm sure it does seem that way to some people at, at times and what have you so i've lived here long enough to at least pick up on some of the history about manassas and purchases or oh, excuse me doing things such as building the harris pavilion was controversial at a time um i'm i'm told that even buying property that eventually became the airport was controversial uh at at its time and let's think about it back way way back when it was bought to have people envision you know one day there'll be an airport here and they're looking like but I got to pay for this right now, or it's being, you know, paid for right now, that sort of thing. Same thing with Lake Manassas. The art factory was a building that the city purpose wasn't universally supported by everyone on council in, in, in that particular case. And yet I think now we look back and we say, I can't imagine old town Manassas without the art factory or without the pavilion, which was built because i believe the southern states was there at one time on the pavilion property there uh in in that case what i like to point out is that yes there seems to be a confluence of several purchases that have taken place over the last four years particularly the last two approximately you know we clearly know about the the old town in property and and i i would mention to people at one time i've done looked at the history um there was an actual movie theater on the corner there of, of uh, church and uh, uh, what is that, uh, Main Street. And there was a high rise hotel, you know, but things changed, you know, uh, uh, with the advent of automobiles and traveling, we, we got the old town in and now things change and we're gonna find something else going there along the way, we recognize. Those are just signs of what we have to do. And as I say, redevelopment, usually in the city is going to be things places that are going to get torn down and replaced or modified in some fashion remember that the vote for marsteller for the old town inn property for the masses shopping center were all unanimous and bipartisan and and that it to me is a remarkable sign that everybody on council saw sort of the same sorts of things. So speaking to this confluence of purchases here, I've told folks as I go around and we talk about some of this thing, I said, in some ways, we are at a transformative period of time for Manassas. If we are able to come back, if I live, live long enough or someone else lives long enough or whatever, and comes back 20 years from now, Manassas could be very different in certain areas along the way. And that's why these sorts of things going on, taking place here. So from my standpoint, I'm looking at the Old Town Inn property as uh, being a property that will be uh, put to private use. You know, the city won't own it, but as, as owning the property, it gives us the opportunity to decide what happens there, what goes there. Same thing with the shopping center. And you know what, one of my reasons is chance to do something about housing um, along the way and also start what i hope will be a redevelopment change along mathis and maybe elsewhere along the way uh on on that sort of thing which is why 
one of my my priorities and why I'm running is that uh, I want to make sur certain that the city's recent purchases uh, actually provide the desired benefits to to our residents here. Uh, I think it'd be I, be suffering from hubris if I said I made the decision and then let someone else figure it out. I, I want to help see that vision. I had reasons for doing. Clearly, the Marsteller property is for civic use. Fire station, which is needed because we are uh, crowded in space in station one. The opportunity to get a community center, an additional community center. And I, you know, while we have the Boys and Girls Club, having a second one is certainly not going to hurt, especially with the opportunity to do more things there as well as getting some athletic fields uh, on, on, on that property. So from my standpoint, those were all reasonable purchases. But as I said, there were do some- Do you anticipate more of these types of purchases in the, over the next four years if, if you're reelected? Do you, do you see more of these coming down the pike? Um, the only way I would see uh, additional purpose uh, purchases, and again, we're sitting here September 18th, you know, looking at what we see and know and so forth, would be any kind of purchase that might enhance what we're already doing uh, as opposed to. But let, let me be honest, if if suddenly uh, we could add on to the Manassas Shopping Center, from my standpoint, you know, property and be able to get adjacent property, I would certainly look at it. But I'm hopeful, what I'm really hopeful is, is that what we do on the shopping center property incentivizes other people to say i can do this on this property and i don't need the city to own it this is what we'll we'll do along the way more right. i want to switch to some of the property that you guys sold and, and that was for a data center and this week we reported that the george mason university science and technology campus is raising a red flag because as they as they walk outside of their building they're taking a look around and they're seeing nothing but data centers sprout up on uh, all around. And right. so they are now concerned that um, there may not, th that, well, they want, they want land to build and pursue educational uh, pursuits. That's, that's they what they want. And they're, they're concerned that if they're choked out by data centers, that may not happen for them over the next 20 or so years. Manassas uh, has not seen the explosive growth of data centers like Prince William County has because simply you're 10 square miles. You just don't have the the, the room that Prince William County does to put these sure. football field sized buildings with computer servers in them. Uh, but we are seeing centers prop. We have we're we sending us uh, crop up on Godwin and on Dean Drive, uh, and and the, and one to be built on property that I mentioned was sold at the airport. Uh, so and and some have told me there are other areas that that could be ripe for redevelopment, such as the Euclid Corridor in Manassas uh, that is already zoned industrial. Right. So as we take a look at uh, these in, these data centers that continue to, to crop up in the city and, and outside the city, mostly outside the city, uh, what's the future? W where should these things go? How many should we have in Manassas? And 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 what are the uh, what are you hearing from residents who uh, who, th who may think it's a great thing because of the economic benefit? Who but what are you hearing from those who may be concerned because they're fearing we may not have enough power to to power all of these uh, from the environmental perspective? Always legitimate concerns there uh, on on that. So first of all, um, I think where are we the four data centers are are going to be located are located are uh, are appropriate uh i think the attempt has been made to really isolate them away from neighborhoods but like anything there are times where i live i can i can hear the announcer for the osborne high school football game when old dominion speedway was open i could hear that friday and saturday night uh, along the way here. So we are in suburbia, you know, we are an urban environment of some, and we're going to have different, we are going to have no noise along the way. And the fact that it's so quiet that that noise can travel is actually to me a pretty good sign. Things are relatively quiet in, in our city here, uh, on that. Where they, 
whether we should have more or less, well, not less, but more, um, you know, at, at this point, I'm, I'm not aware of any uh, attempt to, to do that. As you say, they are, you know, data centers for us would be in, in industrial areas and zone. We'd have to look closely this to see, uh, like the Euclid air, air area, if somebody came along and wanted to do it, because part of what I'm a big believer in from my first land use decision in January of 2021, I went to our comprehensive plan that had just been adopted. And of course, you probably know we're, we're doing, uh, we're coming up on our five years and we're working on through the planning commission first, but other committees are going to be working on revisions and then we're going to put it out for community input just as we did five years ago. And we may, so for instance, the Mathis Avenue portion of the comprehensive plan is going to change a bit because things have changed, haven't they? So along the way, we may be doing the same thing when we get to industrial areas or the Euclid uh, uh, Avenue um, corridor, I'll call it, and maybe looking at, I'm not aware of any, but as I said, these are all things on the table, so to speak, to say, well, as we move forward, is this a better place to put housing? Is this a better place to do retail? Or is this a place to put a arts, you know, take these old buildings and renovate them for like an artist colony of some kind or what have you? I don't know. I like the, I, the fact that we have possibilities in this city still, and that's the amazing part. On the electricity thing, darn right. Every, I mean, I get concerned, you know, uh, when I just see, you know, what going on in the country, you know, where we're, we're seeing our atmosphere and carbon monoxide and everything of that sort, and how how we get our electricity. So we're right to be concerned. I think on our through our utility commission, uh, we try very hard to make sure that uh, residential electric lines are separated from the the power that comes from dominion that would go through a substation to each of these data centers along the way beyond that how dominion produces it though uh you know is one of those things that i can have an opinion about personally i don't know how much i can affect actually what happens would i like to see more solar more wind more alternative energy nuclear or whatever of course i think those are the what we have to do and and to that point um should the council be advocating to groups like the northern virginia regional commission which you will have a member of um for instance the yunkin administration has talked about finding new sites for nuclear uh, they call them the small nuclear but nuclear is nuclear to me i don't care how big or small it is it's it's, it's nuclear yeah freaking nuclear um but but they have they have said we need to find new sources of energy so should the council be pushing and advocating for that because we're seeing so much demand we're seeing demand in our region grow and there are some fears that it may we may no longer have enough as it currently sits to power what we have and of course if that's the case if they have to build new infrastructure that cost always gets passed along to the it rate payer Right. And so should the council be advocating for new sources of energy exploration? Well, I don't know. I I, th I think the way we, we do that is through our representation on various COG, I'll call them subcommittees. Uh, as you know, uh, we have a representative on the COG board of directors and then different members, myself included. I happen to serve on the, the climate change subcommittee of COG. We meet quarterly. Our discussions are primarily oriented toward ways of, um, you know, reducing electric usage or getting away from fossil fuels, as you can well imagine. Have more electric charging stations, have more tree canopies, as an example, making walkable, bikeable uh, uh, areas, neighborhoods, and things of that sort along the way here. So this is where I think we first have the chance to influence stuff because we're, we're a small par part. It is like trying to solve the affordable housing or the housing situation, lower housing prices. Manassas all by itself could never make, make a serious dent in, in the housing um, deficit that we have in Northern Virginia. Do we have a part to play? Of course we do, but it's proportionate to our size and our, what we have 
to to um, uh, to to work with in areas like Prince William, obviously have will have a greater impact on all of those kinds of things. So don't get me wrong. Am I concerned? Of course I'm concerned. I pay, try to pay attention. I'm looking at that and I, and I want to see. No one wants to pay more for electricity and, and we, I think we do a good job uh, through our uh, Municipal Electric Association. We're one of uh, seven or eight towns and cities that participate. We have a part to play and I think what we do exceptionally well in that to remind those that are watching this is that we we when it when electric demand gets very high, whether it's winter time or summertime, we have the capability of of uh, of generation here through diesel engines, which again not the, the 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 cleanest, but we are able to provide electricity to the grid, so to say, to our customers and 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 shave off the peaks there, so we're not always hit by the highest highest amounts there. We don't like running them, but that's part of how we, we we can operate along the way. Should we want to change to something else? I don't know that we'd be putting windmills up in, in Manassas around town along the way, and we don't have the room uh, for, for really any kind of solar. So we're going to be dependent on other other places to do those kinds of things for us. Okay. Well, as we wrap up, I, yeah. I want to give you a platform uh, to, to lay out exactly why voters should vote for you all right well that's that's so broad there you know a politician never passes <laughs> away some time to 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 uh to talk about that sort of thing so real quickly the things i i'm looking forward that i talk about for the future because people say why are you running now and one of them is that i want to lower the residential tax burden by growing the commercial sector i think one way we have the opportunity is with the, the data centers our data centers while there are four of them are not all coming online at the same time there's going to be enough time that we're going to see uh, them to be able to come in and uh along the way i want to as i mentioned earlier i want to make sure our, our land purchases that we've made actually uh provide the desired uh benefits that and, and quality of life that we've talked about here and uh, that's that's making overseeing those projects to make sure from a very high level, but making sure that that's what's happening there. I want to take advantage of the Manassas Shopping Center to have a portion for attainable housing. I think that's an important part. And then lastly, we talked about this earlier. I want to improve the quality of public education by uh, providing uh, the appropriate economic uh, support, financial support to the schools. You know, most of the, the, the key are the, are, are the teachers there. And, uh, you know, we, we want to make sure that just as we do on the city level of trying to retain and recruit the right kinds of people, school system has to do that. And it starts with our teachers along the way. And we have to figure out ways that maybe we, uh, schools take on some new initiatives along the way. And some of those may cost some money that hopefully in the growth in the um, commercial sector, we're going to be able to answer a little bit more. So those are my four things that I'm. I tell voters and residents that I will be working on for the next four years. Tom Osina is a current incumbent city councilman on the Manassas City Council, and he's running for re-election in the November 2024 general election. Mr. Osina, we really appreciate you coming on and talking with us today. Well, Uriah, it's been a pleasure, and uh, I appreciate your questions. And most of all, what I would say is whether you vote for me or not, and I would hope you would vote for me, but uh, the most important thing is to go out and vote. Early voting starts on the 20th of September, and of course, Election Day is November 5th. Thanks again for the time and the opportunity.